Thursday, I think, of sunshine. I must be allergic to sunshine. <laughs> I don't know what sort of thing. Nothing can be blooming yet. So uh, uh, the, the folks from Buffalo said that people were still looking at 38 degrees on the thermometer there. So I don't know if the Lucases are just the most hospitable people. You have more visitors in than I've ever seen. Is it, is it that you're really hospitable or if they want to have Buffalo? Which one? Do you <laughs> Easily either. Either one of those. Well, I want to share with you tonight, and I'll let you know who I'm going to be talking about tonight. If you'll answer the question, tell me a character in the Bible who has no parents. Who is a character in the Bible that has no parents? Adam. Adam. Who else? Enoch. Enoch. Well, it's kind of a trick question. It's Joshua, son of Nun. And uh, anyways, um, I promised you last time I, I preached that I, I had several um, sermons from the uh, book of Joshua. In fact, not just the book of Joshua, but the first chapter of Joshua. And not just the first chapter, but the first nine verses of Joshua. So we're going to camp there again tonight. We're going to take a look at the, the nation of Israel and what they were doing as they were preparing to cross into the promised land. Do you remember, anybody remember at all, it was a couple weeks ago, I know, so do you remember at all what we talked about last time when we talked about Joshua? Remember we talked about the fact that, that God's will being accomplished is not dependent on any person or any place. I think that was really important for us. And the other thing was, one of the other things was that we can't look back and move forward. Okay, we've got to be keep, we've got to keep our eyes forward and keep it's not it's okay to remember things and have the heritage, but if we, if we keep focusing on what's behind us and keep dwelling on that, we can't move forward. Um, so that's some of what we talked about with Joshua the last time. And I think it's important that we, we understand, you know, the children of Israel have there's a lot of things we need to, to take from that. And to be honest with you, I always told this before, I, 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 I never know exactly what I'm going to share when I'm up here, because I, I, I'm as interested as you are to hear what I'm going to say, to be honest with you. I don't ever you know. But uh, Joshua has become kind of a hero of mine, uh, and and I never really studied him much before. But I, I, my, my path has kind of followed his in many ways. I've kind of usually been the second in command, hopefully faithfully serving somebody else who's the leader, as Joshua did with Moses. But... Um, we're looking now at the, at the nation of Israel, and they're poised and ready to cross into the promised land. And um, there's a, a, a funny story that's told about some people that were in the midst of a hurricane. And as they were hunkering down and, and trying, to, trying to bolster up some courage, this, this preacher just stood up and said in his great oratorical voice, he said, He said, O oh Lord, send us the spirit of the children of Israel, the children of Moses, the children of the promised land. And some little old time in the corner said, Lord, don't send nobody. You come yourself. This ain't no time for children. <laughs> so the people of Israel were kind of dealing with a difficult time, and they were trying to get bolster the courage to be able to cross over into the promised land. And we're taking a look at uh, Joshua chapter 1. If you'll stand for the reading of God's word, let's stand together. I'm just going to read that 1 through 9, and we'll take a look at some of the particular passage there. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, a, Moses, my servant is dead. Remember the, the key phrase from last time was now then. Okay, now then leads into something big. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon to Lebanon and from the great river of the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Again, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. 
Do not be discouraged. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You can be seated. Thank you. So here they are poised at the, the Jordan River. They've been in, in the, the wilderness and they've been wandering around. And, and God has been sustaining them and giving them everything they needed. For how long? 40 years they've been wandering there and God's been providing all the things they needed. So they're just, I mean, if you've ever been to the Jordan River, I've not, but I've seen talk about the pictures of it. Like, there's very steep banks, very intense banks, and when the river is high, during the harvest season, it is a raging river. And when is it they come to the river? It's during the harvest time, and the river is very, very high. So they're looking at this thing, and, and, and Joshua's going, we're crossing this baby. And they're going, what? So we're, we're talking about how many people? We're talking, some say it's going to be 3 million people getting ready to cross the Jordan River. So they're saying, what are we supposed to do? Like, build a bridge, build boats for three million people? How's that going to work? What are we going to be doing? If the, the, the Jordan River is a very deep river, very, but what did God say he was going to do? Once the priest stepped in, what was going to happen? The Red Sea all over again. It's going to be backed up from, from up to the, from the far reaching part of the river. It's going to stop. They're going to walk across on dry land. So God had promised them, now that you're going to cross into the new country, into the promised land, I'm going to give you safe passage to this river. They'd seen it happen before. Some of them had. Some of them had not. In fact, most of them had not because this was a new generation of people. But they were getting ready to cross over into the, the, the promised land. After all this time, they're finally getting ready to cross over into the promised land. You know, there's a, there's a story about three hikers that, were, uh, that, that came to a raging river. And they knew they had to cross this raging river. And the first one said, how are we going to get across this river? And he said, Lord, just give me the strength to get across this river. All of a sudden, he had big old muscles, and he swam across. And he almost drowned several times. But two hours later, he crossed the river. And the second one, Lord, Lord, give me the tools I need to cross this river. And so all of a sudden, the boat came. He rode, he rode, he almost capsized numerous times. He was working and working and stuff. And going across the river, finally got across about an hour and a half. It was amazing. Third one said, Lord, give me the intelligence to cross this river. And poof, he became a woman, looked at the map, went three miles up the river, and crossed over on a bridge. <laughs> I know you ladies were like, sorry, Dad. Uh, but that's not an option they had. There was no bridge over the river, and so they had to find a way across the river, and they were going to go. Uh, God was going to provide a way. You know, as they were going, there's a lot of uh, a lot of representations, a lot of things that we can get from understanding the time of the wilderness and the time of the promised land and what those represent in our lives. But there was a guy named Bill, uh, Bill Kiefer that wrote a blog that I would encourage you if you get a chance to look it up. It's called The Wilderness uh, Versus the Promised Land. And he talked about the fact, and I mentioned this the last time I was talking with you, he mentioned the fact that the wilderness was about preparation and the promised land was about occupation. So now the, the, the children of Israel have been, have been taken care of, and they've been given the food they need, they've been given light to travel and stuff, they've been given all these things, protection, and all of a sudden it's time to go to the promised land where they've not been guaranteed these things. And in fact, they, when they went into the promised land, did all those things happen? No, they didn't have those things anymore. So it was a time of, it was a time of graduation from really being children to kind of being adults. It was time for them to step up. And here's what, here's what this guy said in his blog, Bill Keeper said in his blog. I thought it was really good. I, it, it's kind of an extended quote, but I, I want you to think about this because this really gives us a lot of, to think about um, when we look at what is this analogous to? It's about our Christian life. It says in the wilderness, if the wilderness is about preparation, the promised land is about occupation. We are to occupy until Jesus comes. It is often easier to win a war over a nation's military than it is to occupy the nation afterward. When we occupy, we must govern. Not just the occupied territory, but ourselves as well. We become responsible for the place we occupy. Fully walking in the land of promise is the ability to take responsibility for our actions and for the move of God in that place. So no longer are they children. They're going to have to step up and go, you know, Many of us have kids that we had, they had to go from being children where everything was being taken care of. Have you ever seen, seen a baby bird? The parent not only feeds the bird, the baby bird, but it also chews the food for it and then puts it in their mouth. You know, hopefully none of us did that as parents. I hope we didn't do that. 
But some of us have gone pretty, gotten pretty close to that. But there comes a time when children have to stand up and be adults. And this is what this is really what the nation of Israel is doing. It's time for them to cross the Jordan and step up and become adults. Now, is that an easy thing for most people to do? Is it, is it, is it easy for, for anybody to do? Not really. And so the nation of Israel was probably a little bit, you know, they were probably hesitant. And Joshua was going, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take this, this land. Um, but he had given them promises. And Joshua was sharing with them that, you know, here's the promises. Here's the promises we got. And when it says, I will give you this land, what really it's saying in translation is, I have already given it to you. When God makes a promise, it's like it's already been given. And, it's, and he's saying, this land has already been given to you. All you've got to do is take it. It's kind of like salvation. What do we do with people when we tell them about the Lord? We say, this has already been given to you. All you've got to do is take it. Now, here's one of these little spin-offs that I do sometimes. That's not in my notes. But there's, there's a thing going around called easy grace. And I know some people that are sharing with other people that everybody is saved. Some just don't know it yet. Well, that's not what my Bible tells me. My Bible tells me that everybody can be saved, but they have to receive it. They have to take the gift. And that's a fact, that's, that's a fact of what the Bible says. And so the idea of, of universal grace is not biblical. So they had to take the land. It was theirs to be taken, but they had to step in and take it. And this, this was interesting, I thought. In Joshua 3.10, now I, I have a particular leadership style. And, and I don't know if this was the wisest thing for Joshua to do. When he was talking to the people of Israel in Joshua 3.10, he was, he was bolstering them up. And I think he was really preparing them and encouraging them and everything. And, and here's what he said. I thought this was interesting. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Termites, the Parasites, the, all these different types of stuff. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, was that really <laughs> to list all these people that are going to come against him? I just, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not questioning Joshua. This is a great guy. But I'm just thinking, would I have listed all those people? Maybe not. He was trying to prepare him, I understand. But that was just kind of the side thing I thought was interesting. I don't know if you would do that or not, but uh, I that was kind of interesting that he shared those things. But he was telling them, we're going to take all these people on. We're going to take them on. Now, here's the thing about being in the promised land is when they're in the wilderness, when they took, when they, when they conquered an enemy, which wasn't very, there weren't very many battles in the wilderness. But what were they doing when they, when they conquered an enemy in the wilderness? They were just trying to pass through or they were just trying to survive. They weren't, really, they weren't really gaining anything from that. I mean, they were surviving and stuff. The difference in the promised land is when they fought a battle, they were taking territory. They were taking land. See, and so and he goes on in that blog to talk about, it's a really fascinating blog. He goes on to talk about the fact that, that if we're just sitting here asking God to provide for our needs, for our health, for our finances, for our whatever, 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 we're not getting on into the promised land. The promised land is, how do I take territory for God? How do I take territory? It's not just about my survival. It's about how do I take ground for God, for the kingdom of God? And that's what we have to think about. How do we take territory for God? You know, part of the problem with the Vietnam conflict was every time they'd go in and clear out an area, they'd move back and they, the, the Vietnamese would swarm back in. They could not take ground. It was different in World War II. Because as they marched through, they would take territory. So it's impossible to win a war when you're not taking any territory. So that's what they were doing in the promised land. The next thing is, is rising up to God's challenge. You know, in, in 6 and 9, verse 6 and 9, he says, what, what's the catchphrase of this whole passage? Be strong and courageous. He says it three times. Be strong and courageous. Be very strong and courageous. Have I not commanded you to be very strong and courageous? I still remember that the most memorable BBS we've ever had. I don't know what year was that. I don't know what year that was. That was the, one of the best ones that we ever had. It was like, be courageous. We were telling kids to be courageous. Being strong there talks about, really, in the translation would be preparing for battle, strength in battle. And courageous means stout-hearted and determined in the mind. Um, the encouragement is echoed in another text in uh, 2 Chronicles 32, 7. 
Hezekiah said to his people, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there is greater power with us than with him. And throughout Scripture, we see that again. Be courageous. You know, you might see a lot of stuff. You might see a lot of stuff in the world, but I think we've forgotten that God is more powerful than all of the stuff that we see. That's what Hezekiah was telling. You might see millions of, of Assyrians come down. They were the greatest army in the world at that time. They may have seen millions coming over the coming over the hills, but God is for us. And he was telling them, don't worry about it, because God is for us. We walk by faith, not by sight. Well, that goes for us as, as well. And there, you know, it's time for them to move forward into the promised land. Oswald Chambers said, one step forward in obedience is worth years. Of study about it. Amen. One step forward in obedience is worth years of study about it. You can study, 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 study. You can study tactics and strategies. I remember when I was an officer training in the Air Force, man, we had a military strategy class that they just, in their wisdom, they put it right after lunch. And my gosh, it was boring. It was really, I mean, they're asleep. We'd have one guy on the row that would be in charge of. Waking everybody up during the, during the lecture, because if you got caught sleeping during the lecture, they'd come and stand you up on the stage and stuff. But we needed that training. We needed to hear that. But the thing is, you can study military strategy and study and study and study until you put it into action. It doesn't mean anything. And we need to take one step towards obedience. That's better than a lot of training. One, one of the things that, when I was in youth ministry, one of the things that we really Talk, we had a, a really strong youth ministers conference that, that I headed up, and, and um, we used to look at and analyze the Southern Baptist Convention materials. And I love the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, but the materials would kind of go from all about knowledge, and then it would slingshot to all about application. But most often it was about it was about knowledge. And so there wasn't a lot of application. You know, knowledge is great, but without application, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Because people have to understand it's not just about knowing the books of the Bible and where you can find certain things. It's how do I put this into effect in my life? How do I actually do this? How do I live this? And so it's really important to actually step in the direction of what we know. You know, a part of moving forward is getting over the yeah buts. Yeah, but, y'all do that? Yeah, but, I would want to, but, you know, we, we have that yeah buts thing. I think one of the one of the saddest stories in Scripture is, is you know, when Jesus said to the, the young man, he said, follow me. And he said, let me, let me go bury my father first. You know, and Jesus said, what did he say? Let the dead bury the dead. You follow me and God to come. Well, and it wasn't that, you know, you think, well, Jesus was pretty, pretty mean, pretty cruel to say that. Well, it wasn't that the guy's father had just died. What he was saying was, I'm going to hang around here until my father died, and then when I, then when that happens, I'll come follow you. He wasn't saying, you know, let me go to the funeral, which is tomorrow. He was saying, let me hang out here. Let me do it my way, basically. So he said, he said, no. He said, let the, let the dead take care of the dead. And, you know, maybe he was concerned about his inheritance with his dad, whatever. But there's always a lot of things that get in the way of following, isn't there? Isn't there always things that, well, I've got to take care of this, and I've got to take care of that, and having this over here, this is a good study and stuff, but I really got to be able, we, we all do that. You know, if we're moving forward, we've got to, we've got to focus, and we've got to move forward. Like the Bible said, Jesus set his face like flint, unmoving, unwavering on the cross that he was going to go to. And we've got to be like that as well. And finally, there's God's command. And he said, be careful to obey to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. You know, we, the, the thing it talks about there is obeying the word. Now, it is talked about knowing the word, listening to the word, speaking the word, hearing the word. But it says first, even before it says another thing, what does it say? It says, obey the law that Moses gave to you. Obedience. What did Jesus say? How was the indicator of someone that loved Jesus? What did he say it was? Was it they had a big old bumper sticker on their 
on their wagon or something like that, or was it they you had a big a big hat that said I love Jesus, you know? Was it they went to the stadium and said I love Jesus? Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you know? What was it? Who was it that he said loved him? The one who follows my command. Follow, obey. The one that obeys my command. That's the one that loves me. So we can talk all around loving Jesus. We can talk around and around and around about loving Jesus. But it's not until we obey his commands that, that we demonstrate our love for him. And the Bible says, you know, we need to stand on what we didn't know the word. Second uh, Timothy 1.14 says, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Guard the word that's in your heart, in your life. Of course, we all know 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, I know that they say that 95% of the things that you hear, you forget within 72 hours. But that's not going to happen this time, right? If I come up to you 75 hours from now, you're going to know all the points of this, right, that we talked about. I, I can hear saying, yes, we will. Wednesday night, if I quiz you guys, you're going to know what we talked about, right? That's a good idea. I think that's, oh, no, no one's going to come now, Scott. I ain't coming to that. Thing. No way. I'm not going to. Um, but the important thing to remember is, is, you know, we take the scripture in its entirety. There are, there are even whole denominations, whole faiths that, that kind of what they call skip and dip. You know, I skip this part, but I dip into this part. I skip this part. There are whole, I mean, there are whole religions that do that with the Bible. But the fact of the matter is, we do it sometimes too, by, the, by what we pay attention to and what we heed in Scripture. We'll say, I don't really like that part, but this part's good. I'm not going to go with that part, but this part over here is good. Uh, we've got it. The, the Scripture is all God breathed. It's not just some parts of it are God breathed. Um, the scripture that Rose just talked about a minute ago, uh, Romans 10 and 17 says, Now faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to hear from the word of God. D.L. Moody said, The Bible is not written for your information, but for your transformation. The Bible is not written for your information, but for your transformation. You know, the Reverend uh, Albert Muller, in his book, The Scandal of Biblical Illiteracy, he said that fewer than half of all adults can name the four gospels. Many Christians can identify more than two or three of the disciples. According to data from the Barnett Research Group, 60% of Americans can't name even five of the Ten Commandments. No wonder people break the Ten Commandments all the time. They don't even know what they are. The bottom line, increasingly America is biblically illiterate. He further quotes, at least 12% of adults believe that Joan of, Ar Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. <laughs> Another survey of graduating high school seniors revealed that over 50% thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. A considerable number of respondents to one poll indicated that the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. We're in trouble. Because people don't know what the Word of God says. And so we have to be ones that know what the Word of God says. We don't have to have every scripture memorized, but you need to know the context and the content of what the Bible is talking about. Uh, we can't be blessing, you know, the word can't be a blessing to us, and we can't be a blessing to the world if we don't know what the word, the word says. So we need to read it, we need to study it, we need to meditate on it, memorize it, and perhaps most importantly, we need to obey it. Uh, I've told this story before, but uh, Robert Carlton, Dr. Robert Carlton's son, Max, was my karate instructor, and he just got a mind like a steel trap, just like his dad. He memorized the entire book of Ephesians. And one of the things that he told me one time is he said he was he was a he was like Bruce Lee he was like a little bumblebee and when he went to spar with him you know he, he'd go to strike at him and he'd be having pummeling and kidneys and stuff but one of the things he said to me was he said that he said it's it's you know I said why did you study the martial arts he's a very he's a very small guy a little tiny guy and he said he said you know if if some guy's jumping on the street or something like that. If I have a gun back home, it doesn't do me any good. I can't say, hey, would you guys just hold that thought for a minute? I'm going to get my gun. We'll come back and we'll put it, settle this up. That's not going to happen. He said, my body has to be a weapon. And he said, the same thing is true of the word of God. You know, if somebody comes up and has a question for you, you can't go, I've got a Bible. Let me go to my house and get it and I'll come back. I mean, there are sometimes we can defer, but sometimes people need an answer. 
their investments in Twitch, we may not ever see them again. We've got to be able to share with, with people what the Word of God says. So we you know, uh, my word if I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, and so I might be able to impart wisdom to others I come in contact with. So it's important that we know it, that we study it, meditate on it. You know, when it talks there about, about the word, it talks about, about being able to don't let the word proceed from your mouth. Don't, it means it means keep saying it. It sounds kind of like it's saying don't let it come out of your mouth, but it's saying don't let it ever escape from your mouth or it's not there anymore. The word actually means like kind of a, a muttering, which means I'm always speaking the word of God. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I, I, I served with a lady one time that every, everything that she spoke was just scripture. It was just scripture. I'm not so sure that's the way to go. I mean, it was, I mean, everything was scripture. And, you know, they're, they're, it's okay to have other words than just scripture. And we have to be able to, to but we need to put scripture into the conversations that we have. Um, but we need to understand what the content of the word says that we can impart that to other people and share that with those that don't know. And even people that do know. Some people that have been Christians for a long time, they don't have a clue about what the word says about a lot of stuff. So we can't assume that just because people have been Christians for a long time, it means they know all about the Bible, they've studied it, they know the word and stuff. This is not true. Even people in our churches. I mean, we know that there are, there are lots and lots of people in our churches that, that are Christians. But even the people that are Christians, a lot of them don't know a lot about the Bible. They just don't. So part of obeying is sharing our faith. Uh, the Great Commission says, go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation." You know, we, we're supposed to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to share with you a couple little, little insider tips, a couple little secrets here. Um, I, was, I was talking with Will a sermon a couple weeks ago. Um, the preacher was talking about Matthew chapter 20. And in Matthew, Matthew chapter 20, it talks about the people, the workers that came, and the guy hired them. And some he hired in the morning, and some he hired later in the morning, some he hired at noon. Some he hired it later in the afternoon, some hired just an hour before the time was to get the time to get off the whistle blow. Um, you know that story. The story of the workers. And and what happened was, we know that the story says that the guy that was the employer of these people, he said, I'm gonna pay, he, he said, Well, I'm gonna pay the people, and I want the people that came in last. The people that came in just an hour before it's time to get paid and time to get off. I want them to come first. And so the ones that were the ones that were there, they were coming to get their money and stuff like that. The ones that had been there the longest, folks, man, they got this much. We're going to get so much more. Isn't that awesome? Well, when it came time for them to get their money, what they get? The same amount of money. Have you ever read that and said, that's just not fair? Have you ever read that and said, I can be honest. I can be honest. Have you ever said it's not fair? That's just not fair. Well, here's the thing. Put yourself in the place of one of the people who hired the earliest. And then put in the role of the person hired just an hour before it was time to go, your child. What does it look like to do that? Then I like it. When it's my kid, I like it. Why? Because I love my kid. You love your kids. We've got to put ourselves in, in, in a different place paradigm, because what we're thinking of is, well, those people didn't work as long. When it's your kid, when it's somebody you love, you're thankful they're getting all the rewards they can possibly get, all the benefits they can possibly get. Well, here's the 